Welcome to West of Tulsa. I'm C.J. Ward, and we are broadcasting from Studio 3 in Ventura, California. Pretty much the whole crew's here. Helm is missing today. Hmm. But we got Beth, we got Gabe, we got Dan, and we have a great show for you because Dana Newquist is joining us, and we got Bruce Terry. Now, Dana, how do I describe you? I mean, you're. I want to say you're a classic car collector, but you're... So many more things. You're with the local chapter president of AACA. You're always working on some kind of crazy project, and you wrote Bruce into this latest project called Platypus. Bruce, you're a metal fabricator, master metal fabricator, or just fabricator. What? What would? How should we define you? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> Was I close? Well, I, I consider myself more or less a sculptor. Oh, there we go. Uh, and that's, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, yeah put it's, it. there's definitely sculpting uh, there definitely as elements in it. Yeah, and how about did I was I close with you, Dana? Well, I've been interested in cars and collecting cars all my life. Uh, my older brother, when I was maybe five or six, he was ten years older than I was, and he had a group of his buddies. And when he was 15, anticipating getting his driver's license, he bought a 1940 Plymouth four-door. I mean, I think he paid 20 bucks for it. <laughs> it, it had a dead engine, and all these guys got together to put a new engine in it. And I was totally fascinated by this process. And how old were you again? Five or six. Okay, five or six, wow. So <laughs> I got to learn what uh, the sizes of wrenches and different kinds of screwdrivers. And, of course, uh, back then there was no such thing as Phillips screwdrivers. <laughs> they were all <laughs> flat blade. Anyway, so I was very excited to work with these men and put this together and on its first virgin uh drive ride yeah ride the guys it was a four-door it was anyway so they got it running they were all excited and uh they were going through town and this is a suburb of uh chicago it's called glen ellen uh they got up on the crest of a railroad track and the engine died oh no oh you're kidding and then the gates started coming down. Oh, no. And these guys were panicking, as I was. <laughs> and three of them got out and pushed it across the tracks anyway. Of course, <laughs> nothing really happened other than the scare of the uh, moment. So the adrenaline rush is why you're now doing what you're doing. And you just, the, the rush of, I don't know. What, what you're going to get yeah. down the road is I, part that, of the... That's what started it. Yeah, that's what started The near-death experience. Wow. Yeah. At, at five years old. Yeah, incredible. Five or six or whatever. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So, at, uh, at that age, did you learn the language of the mechanics back in the day in garage talk? You know, when you're a young kid, you're trying to pick up everything, <laughs> you know, so... If they were talking in uh, Latin, I would have picked that up, but of course they weren't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I learned about transmissions and engines and carburetors, et cetera. So, so Dana has a pretty amazing collection. And, and what I like about your collection is it's a little bit of everything, and there's no rhyme or reason to it, and I love it. Um, and Platypus, which if, if you've been following any of our social medias, you've seen Platypus. Crazy thing. Started off as an airplane, 1948 airplane, and now these two guys are reimagining it. So, Bruce, Dana roped you in on this. Talk a little Apparently. bit about Platypus. The first time Dana approached you and said, hey, I got this project for you. Well, I more or less decided to um, try to retire a little bit, slow down the process. I had a shop in Monterey where I was doing five or six projects at one time, and and I, I turned 65 or so, so I decided to uh, attempt to retire and just kind of finish up a few cars that I had going at the time. And then uh, I di didn't really plan on doing any uh, outside commercial work. But he walked in, and I just, I just you know, liked his character, his enthusiasm in the first place. <laughs> and uh, Did you and two know each other before that? Uh, no. no oh, we, wow. We met right. through uh, Seth and a couple other people up in Santa Barbara okay. that, uh, that I had done work for. 
and uh, so he, his enthusiasm was overwhelmingly um, appreciated by me. And he said, "You got to come over to this museum and look at this uh, fuselage that I picked up in Santa Paul Airport." <laughs> a fuselage, yeah, yeah go check so out this fuselage. That why are we like looking retirement. at? A, <laughs> why are we looking at a fuselage? <laughs> And then I walked in there, and the, you know, there it's set with the set of wheels and 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 the, an engine and a couple of pieces. Of, and I go, well, he said, um, I want to turn this into a car. I want to make this a car, a drivable car. <laughs> and up to this point, you're thinking, oh, he's a pilot, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I had no idea, but um, so the enthusiasm was so high, and um, it was an interesting project. It was not a restoration project, which is kind of refreshing because restorations are everything is predetermined by the designers and the fabricators, like how everything puts put together. This one was open an open book, so it, it made it was creatively interesting for me. What <laughs> era? Excuse me. What era <laughs> is the fuselage, and does that kind of lend itself to you artistically? Forties. Oh, but yeah, the the Art Deco mm -hmm. um, design concepts that I've tried to put into this car. Beautiful. Yeah, what I was going to say was it just <clears throat> I, you know since b being at their shop and seeing what they're doing, you guys just dream it up and then give it a shot. Yeah, is that kind of what is that fair to say? Just oh, let, mm -hmm. here's what we can do with this. And let's see yeah, if we can make it, it work. It's, it's like a, a dream, uh, you know, constantly being uh, evolved as time goes on. Dana, did uh, you know? Um, of Bruce before you reach out to him or did you just, just found out about him and then reach out to him or no I mean luckily we've got connections all over the place you know and I was looking for at first this was going to be a three-wheel vehicle and I had bought a frame for it I bought an engine for it um, and I had uh, Daniel Vesa and I don't know if you've met him, but Daniel Vesa was a uh, instructor over at Art Center. And he knows Chip and he knows um, uh, Seth and a number of other people. Uh, so I started working with Daniel. He made some renderings of what was going to be uh, the platypus, although when when Bruce came over to inspect Platypus, I think he made the initial assessment that the aluminum on the body itself was not workable. Mm. The aluminum was too old. It would fracture. Uh, there were too many problems with it. So uh, taking a leap forward, everything had to change. And I wasn't in anticipation of this, but we're building something from ground up, everything. I mean, we had to build a custom frame. The entire body is hand formed, wow. everything. And so as we're going through this, um, and unfortunately, poor Bruce has racks <laughs> of stuff that I've bought over time thinking, Oh, let's put this on there or let's use this or whatever. And most of them got the nose. <laughs> Forget it. So That's you, not going to work. Do you incorporate the original aluminum and just reinforce or you're scrapping that all together? Well, there is a section of the uh, original framework that we're able to use in the front of the car. One piece. We were hoping <laughs> to be able to use some of it. <clears throat> and uh, we were able to use the internal framework on the front of the car. And then there's actually a, a door, an inner door panel that we're able to use for the one door. And when you stick your head in, you can see it. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It looks like you're looking at yeah. the car. So you of an can airplane. see some elements of the original and, and the, the stamping from the original airplane. So all the pieces that you brought that are on the shelf that he said no to, why, why <laughs> did you say no to them? Or why were pieces considered or not considered? Well, you know, as this was evolving, okay, <laughs> and the body's taking shape. And then, you know, we thought, wouldn't it be cool to have pontoon fenders on the front and they articulate with the steering um, and then the spears on all the wheels and all this design features coming into play. And some of those are borrowed from, you know, Art Deco cars, maybe uh, Delages or uh, Bugattis or whatever. Um, so what i was gathering early on 
just didn't fit what was happening. Mm. What part, we were part of the making. creative process. <laughs> right. That's just what happens, right? Right. I, I, run by, I run by the adage of less is better. And adding more things doesn't make things necessarily better. Sure. Is, does, and I don't, hope I don't offend you by saying this. Does this fall under rat rod category? No. Not at all. No. Not at all. Not, Not even. at all. Okay. And then no, no barbed wire in this car. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or rust. The rust. Or yeah. pizza trays. Yeah. And, and do you just put word out that I am looking for a fuselage because I want to turn an airplane into an automobile? Is that not not at all. Or? No. Uh, Stephen Butcher uh, had a place over in um, Santa Paula. Okay. And it was a warehouse. And he built cars and other props for the movie industry i think we've met him yeah and his place is called funky junk and you've been there yep, yep. That's a great anyway place. i used to go over and visit his stuff just out of fascination um so <clears throat> i'm over there this is 10 years ago and i look up in these rafters and i see this fuselage and i said Stephen, what are you doing with that he says oh i don't know someday i'll get to it well, five years went by, <laughs> and I said, Stephen, you haven't done anything with that. Can I buy it? No. Nope. This went on for, I don't know, two or three years, and one day he said, well, maybe. <laughs> so I said, okay, what's your price? So we settled on a price, and I said, okay, I'll buy it if you take it over to the Murphy Auto Museum. And so that was the fuselage of a 1948 Republic CB amphibious airplane. So, um, you know, in the 40s and 50s, when this was built, they were used uh, almost exclusively as a seaplane, pretty much in the Seattle mm -hmm. up to uh, uh, Alaska. They were used a lot up there. So anyway, that's how I obtained that fuselage. And, you know, we took it from there, which the body was not really usable, nor was the idea about a three-wheeler. And then that's when <clears throat> Chip Foose kind of comes into play here. So I'm thinking about how am I going to power this thing now? And now it's going to be four-wheel, not three. So um, Chip goes up to um, Seth Hammond's place often. Uh, and so I see him quite, quite often up there. So I said, Chip, I've got this. I show him some pictures. And he goes, wow, what is that? You know, and I, I said, well, uh, that's platypus. And he got a chuckle out of that. <laughs> so um, I said, Chip, you know, I've got a dilemma. I've got a thousand different drivetrains that I could use on this. What do you think? And he says, well, it's a 1948 Republic CB airplane. So with respect to that, why don't we go vintage and why don't we look for a uh, Ford or Mercury uh, flathead V8 of that vintage? <clears throat> I said, well, okay. So what we did, we sourced a 19." 48 mercury flathead uh, and we tied it to a c4 automatic transmission so the drivetrain is mid-engine and you sit right in front of that engine and transmission and the positioning uh, is quite unique so Everything's quite you know, unique. <laughs> yeah, we're we're hoping to have a nice balance on this vehicle. Yeah, yeah. No, it looks great. And, and have you guys heard it run? I would imagine the. I've sound. heard the engine run. Yeah, yes, okay. we've that, tested that. Be, I mean, I love the sound of a forty-eight Merc. I mean, it's going to be have that nice rumble to it. Dana, could I ask? Um, I'm curious about um, did did you or Bruce or did you commission have any sort of artist rendering? Because the car I've seen, you know, I shot the video for the car. It's a very distinct aesthetic. It's very unique looking. It's uh, everyone that I've shown the video to is like, well, I've never seen anything like that. Did you have like an art artist or did Bruce do sketches? I don't know if you're an artist, Bruce, is, uh, in that aspect as far as sketching. Are there any sketches that exist of platypus as it's become? Well, the beginning of it with uh, starting with 
uh, Daniel Vesa, he had done some sketches, mm. which were quite interesting. But if you saw those sketches, and I have them, um, to where we are today, they're very different. Mm. Yeah, so that was very, that was the genesis of it. But, right. But so um, you tweaked and, it. <laughs> Well, the biggest factor that we were trying to understand is where are we going to put the front wheels with respect to the body? Because we've got to have a certain turning radius. And that evolved into, okay, we want to make this thing really cool somehow. So uh, not only the turning radius and where you put the front axle, to gain that turning radius, mm. but also what about putting pontoons over those wheels to make it look very streamlined? So um, I would hesitate to tell you how much each one of those pontoons cost. <laughs> so I won't. <laughs> well, and what's interesting is the pontoon, when you see the video, it's kind of splits right in the middle of the pontoon, and that's how the wheel turns. Who came up with that idea? Because that's, that's pretty clever. Well, uh, we started out with designing the rears. So the rears have a nice, long, elongated shape from the 40s, kind of art deco-y shapes. And then, of course, to go to the front with the problem with the turning radius and the, and the frame and everything, uh, in order to get the same, to re repeat the same gen general design, uh, and typically what they've done in a lot of uh, other cars that they've built is they build uh, a fender that's very broad. So there's a little teeny wheel in the side, yep. and, and, but it, it's a bulbous front fender which to me looks like they're doing it, you know, for the purpose of turning the wheel. It doesn't really flow with the design of the car. So in order to keep the fender uh, uh, thin to match up with the rears, the only way to do that would be to have a split to where the one part stays stationary and the forward part uh, it articulates with the front, front uh, steering. But that brings up another problem, which Bruce can address because you've got, this wheel in front obviously going up and down you've got weight when you're putting passengers in the vehicle plus you've got fuel and other things and so how do you keep that look streamlined because you've got all these factors going on and so why don't you address that bruce Oh well, there's a certain spring load, so there's a there's a you know maybe half an inch or an inch up and down um, when the cars uh, just when people are climbing in and out of it. So we have to design it to where when it's empty, sitting at a show, for example, no no humans in it, and we're, and we're locating the fuel tank in a place where it won't have a big effect on on the on the pressure, so the, the, to keep the alignment of the of the spears. So the, I'm making the rear half of it an adjustable um, element to where I can adjust it up and down, back or forth, depending on the circumstances that we end up with. Wow. Um, Incredible. You know, uh, nowadays people throw these types of projects at computers and AI. You're oh, doing yeah. all of this. <laughs> yeah, I'm That's kind of an old, I'm an old school yeah. guy, just kind of, you yeah. know. And then, you know, when, when it's all said and done, once they add the extra weight, maybe uh, I have 120 pounds or something uh, sitting up there right now to illustrate the amount of weight that would be added to it once the, they take the chassis back and add the additional components. Well, and then you got to probably figure into it also the ride when it's in motion, you know, little bumps and. Yeah, well, that, you know, yeah. That, that, that's all got to be factored in, into it as well, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, there's wow. the old adage they say, um, especially as, uh, growing up as a designer, they said uh, form follows function, but it sounds like it's kind of like backwards. Like, function follows form. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, and that goes back to like the <clears throat> collaboration, because you said you, uh, you had talked to uh, Daniel and then uh, Chip, um, and then you got Bruce involved. So this is your project, your idea, but you've had to collaborate with other people getting input from different people working with them and but at the end of the day um it's this project and what what leads it more it's like obviously the look and the form is, would you say the form is first and the function follows that or just you know because everything has to work obviously but you're going off off of a specific look you know that you're going for the art deco 1940s look does that determine 
whether something is yes or a no on the project or well as you can imagine this whole thing is a huge <clears throat> experiment okay so you know the first thing that comes to my mind is what is it going to look like okay and then luckily i've got the people responsible to make it work that know what they're doing so not only bruce but i've got mike gossard and his son who are doing most of the mechanical stuff and all the electrical stuff on it so uh we've got that pretty well figured out but you know even uh, a car that's produced by a major manufacturer they run into problems yeah and you as you know and you don't find those out until actually function mm -hmm. so you know this is this is going to be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Do you have because a CHP officer there as a consultant also to make sure it's street legal when it's all said and done? Just to help. We don't want anybody legal there. <laughs> no, not at all. That's not rotting. That's not hot rotting. Uh, <laughs> however, that's interesting you asked that. I already have the plates for it and the title. Oh, okay. I have it. How um, the integration of the plates on onto the car, I would imagine that's probably, you got to, you know, you don't have 40s plates on it, or do you have 40s plates? Do uh, not. And those plates uh, are actually going to be hidden unless pulled over. <laughs> We'll, we'll you'll, figure. you'll deal that have, with that have, when you get I have stopped. a feeling that might happen at some point, <laughs> maybe once. Out of curiosity, they get pulled, pull, pulled over out of curiosity. He's like, yeah. what is that? Yeah, what? Right. Oh, yeah. The, the first thing out of the office my mouth is, what is this? <laughs> yeah. where, where, where are you from? The airport's that way. <laughs> is, it yeah. a, is it a parade float? What is this thing? <laughs> hey, well, planes fall from the sky all the time. Tires <laughs> <laughs> sure do. I, That's just the, the other day. Kind of a bad joke yeah. from the yeah. news this morning, but... <laughs> <laughs> the, the the airplane wheel that yeah. fell, fell off the jet yeah. Yeah. that happens all the time yeah so as as you're putting um this all together and um uh, i think we'd all agree that the form you know is first and you know what the look of the car is going to be at the end of the day and then make everything working around the form so you have this balance of um science and engineering with artistry you know and and creativity and it seems like the creativity leads everything else does that sound pretty fair well you know if you if you go back in history uh and you say okay some of these manufacturers way back when they had old technology as far as the drivetrain you know and but in order to sell cars they had had to have something that was flashy that people would buy They'd say oh i like the way that looks and then you know how it ran or whatever was an afterthought um we're trying to put the whole package together somehow mm -hmm. and uh so you know reaching back into what i like i like the pre-war stuff all almost all my stuff is pre-war so this kind of has an art deco look to it mm -hmm. which i love mm -hmm. okay and one of one of the details that probably took another long period of time i wanted a stabilizer on the back a fin okay because i just think those are cool and so we spent hours on what that fin was going to look like what the height was going to be and uh so we've kind of settled on that but that took a lot of uh thought in detail so we wanted to keep that in in the realm and style of the vehicle itself mm -hmm. how much fun are you guys having through this pro process i'm sorry i didn't hear that how much fun are you guys having oh i'm having a great time i think J uh, dana's enjoying himself too that, yeah. i mean we Sounds wouldn't like be it. doing it if it wasn't fun yeah because mm -hmm. he doesn't need to do it and i don't need to right. do it well i mean you can just hear it i mean when you guys telling the story oh, you know, yeah. when you guys are having just yeah you know trying stuff out and different things and the reaction when people see it and well you know as you as you go through life in the automotive realm and you're trying to create something i don't care if it's a, a rebuild of an old car or whatever oftentimes you'll find whoever you're dealing with 
And, you know, you've got many crafts. You've got the uh, mechanical side. You've got the body side, paint, and so forth. Um, oftentimes you find the person or people that you're working with kind of lose interest in what you're doing. Mm. And what's exciting about this is there's always excitement mm. there. What's it going to be like? How is it going to run? You know, what kind of reaction are people going to have to this? And, mm. you know, and I've shown the project to, um, Jay Leno also, and, I got the similar reaction to by him looking at it like, <laughs> what is this? And so I anticipate and he and I, uh, I'm supposed to see him in about two weeks, but he may choose this to have on one of his shows. That'd be fun. Oh, yeah. yeah. But we're about we're about a year away. OK, I was gonna, that was going to be a question. How, how close are you? A year. About a year. And how, how long uh, to get to this point have you been into this project? Four years. Four oh, years. it's been four, four years. years. Actually, three and a half. Oh, my God. <laughs> Bruce is Bruce. counting. <laughs> He's marking every no, day off my, his calendar. My checkbook is counting. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I love about you, I, your enthusiasm, I agree with you. You know, I think when you and I first met, I don't know if you remember this, I was at a business meeting at Harry's. And whoever I was talking to had left for just yes. a second. And you practically came and sat on my lap and you wanted to talk to me about something. And I thought, okay. I remember that. <laughs> I remember that too. I thought you sat on my lap. No, 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 no. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Now that's not what the version I heard was. I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> but, your, <laughs> but your enthusiasm just for for events and, and all things that have to do with people. And a lot of it does center around your vehicles, your chitty chitty bang bang that you, we have the honor of driving, except for last year, for the parade 4th of July in Montecito, and your fire truck that you bring every year to the Christmas events and to the Unity Parade uh, yeah. Unity Shop Telephone. Yeah. I mean, all these things, and they just bring so much joy mm. to so many people. You know, it, it's beautiful what you Well, do. I have more fun than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm at the wheel and I'm seeing all these screaming kids in back of me. And, you know, it puts me in my childhood, mm -hmm. which is great. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. really cool. So, um, when we were over at the shop shooting the video of the platypus at, at, at your shop, that's your shop, right, Bruce? Um, right. I noticed um, in the back of your shop, you have a, looks like a recording studio and a lot of instruments and you play instruments you're a musician as well yes uh what what instruments do you play um mostly guitars and harmonica and some okay. drums so. and uh, when we were there i at, when i was asking you uh, uh, about the uh recording studio i was like would you equate uh, the fabrication that you do with uh music you know playing a guitar versus be getting on your english wheel and stuff like that and you said yes there's a, a lot of similarities Is, what can you ex elaborate on that how you see the similarities between the two well, there was an interesting thing that I was going to uh, attempt to record uh, about 10, 15 years ago. When, when, I'm, when I'm forming panels, especially with aluminum, you actually get a tone that, that, that starts to whistle, you know, and, and, and it changes as you're moving across the panel. Oh, wow. From a lower tone to a higher tone. And I always wanted to record that. I never quite uh, got around to doing it. But it's, it's interesting, and I thought about doing a video where the sounds of the planishing and hammering and all that and mixed together with the sounds of the, of the metal whisp, whistling and whispering to, to you when you're forming it and put it all together in an interesting video. But I never, I never got around to doing that. Is those those tones that you're talking about when you're is that uh, a, usually a good sign that you're that's like the, you're looking for those kinds of tones when you're you know they're just happening metal? and you don't even know you're not quite sure why other than you're getting closer to the end of the panel mm -hmm. where where they're actually starting to get higher pitched. So there is a, a audio thing going on when you when you're rolling. A, so that's something that you have to develop over time a skill because you couldn't learn that in a book, right? What that tone is or how, when you're shaping that metal, correct? Well, working with an English wheel is uh, is an art form for sure that takes just many, many years. Uh, I got a little bit of early training, but uh, mostly just been trial and error. Mm. Will you just elaborate? You and I were speaking before we started taping and, and how long you've been doing all of this. And I'm curious what your favorite material medium is to work with. 
Well, I've been doing this since I was like 18. Uh, I got into just metal at about 25. And I was doing paint and other things prior to that. Um, but uh, I'm sorry, what was your second question? Just what type of medium? What what type of material? Do you well, I've know? grown into loving aluminum. <laughs> <laughs> or aluminum. For the Over the last three I, and a half years. I forced that. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I was working in a lot of steel in the earlier days because I was doing the 36, 37, uh, 540K Mercedes bodies. And they're all steel bodies. Most of the German-made uh, cars are steel bodies, but except the, the, with the 300 SL, whatever, it's got some components, uh, hanging parts that are aluminum. So I started doing 300 SLs about 10, 15 years ago. And uh, I, I really loved working with the aluminum components. And so th then I started getting into uh, uh, aluminum race cars, you know, solid body aluminum. And then, of course, when he came up um, with an aluminum car, it just fell right into, the, right into place. It's like but I, I com a type of material I really love working with. So I, I, I'm going back to like your shop and the music aspect of this, I, I kind of vision this, everything coming back to art, right? And music as an art form. Um, like you said, you're not a fabric, you're a sculptor, right? You sculpt metal in which you've created platypus. So you sculpted this shape out of nowhere, basically, you know, you have some inspiration, but you created this thing and you're uh, one component a big component of this build as well as other people that are involved with this and dana you seem to be more like the conductor of this orchestra. <laughs> you're putting the symphony together and making because i mean one yes you're writing the checks but you're also you know determining who gets to work on it who's qualified and who's best for this project you know would you just well that? i've i've given bruce a lot of freedom in that i didn't see the value of lowering or taking out two inches off the body of the, uh, the, the fuselage itself, uh, because as it was higher, it didn't give the, uh, kind of the slipstream, uh, effect that we wanted. Uh, so Bruce went ahead and lowered, uh, the actual body by two inches, yeah. two which inches. really made it uh, give me the look that I wanted. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know he was doing that. And another part of it was, okay, how are we going to fashion the dashboard? We want it to be airplane-like. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I bought dozens of gauges to put in there. So Bruce went ahead and built the dashboard which is very cool and you've got uh what is it an inclinometer right in the middle you know <laughs> and uh so everything is uh done i'd say uh very beautifully uh but create so creatively mm -hmm. and that's a lot Thanks to to uh, Bruce over so, here, Bruce. When you're building something like that, um, are you building and thinking like, "Oh, this is what Dana's looking for," or and or in, and then in collaboration with what you think is going to be good for the project? So is it you have that balance of, you know, you're working with your client and also for the for the car. Basically, do you have that in mind while you're putting that together for somebody like Dana? I'm just primarily focusing on, on what I find visually attractive myself. And then, and then I run it by him. Mm -hmm. Here's an idea. Here's something I came up with. And most often, he walks up and says, "I love it." So just go, go with it. Except for the the center <clears throat> fin, right? That was well, your. We've we've been working on that. <laughs> <laughs> We're still working. You know, it's on a it. <laughs> it's a miracle that that's the only thing we've ever had any kind of conversation <laughs> about. Like, are you sure? And I keep on whittling it down. So there's a comes. level of of trust. Uh, oh, absolutely. Say, right? oh. You have to. Yeah. You have to have that. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, with any collaboration, I don't care <clears throat> if it's cars or anything else, building a house or whatever, you have to have uh, a relationship with the people that you're working with. And would you say that's the key? to what the success that you've had of this build so far is the relationships that you have with everybody on the project oh yeah and you know that spills over to the mechanical side of things also and mm -hmm. you know the engine transmission uh where things are going to be positioned what the functionality is going to be and so on and so forth so there's a lot to think about and 
you've you've really got to have <clears throat> confidence in who you're dealing with. How do you? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was gonna say, is how do you um get? How do you find out about that? Obviously, with time, but when you're initially engaging with Bruce or whoever you have on the project, uh, what helps you determine whether I'm gonna go with that guy or I'm not gonna go with that guy? Well, luckily having interest in the automotive field for years and years and years, you get a pool of people out there that you trust as experts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those that you really trust, if you're lucky, you go to them and you ask them for advice, just like I did with Chip. And that turned out to be a good call. And Mike Gossard has helped me restore 30 or 40 cars oh. and so I've watched his talents I understand he's much he, he knows everything about suspensions engines transmissions etc things many things that I don't understand so I trust him for some of that those things those parts um, and then together uh, collaboratively you know, with Daniel Vesa and uh, Chip Foose. And anyway, we're coming together with what I think will be a very unique product. Hmm. I'm excited. And one one thing, we can't have this discussion without talking about Bruce and his homemade English wheel. And it, talk about that a little bit because, it, it's a, one, it's a beautiful piece of machinery, but you built it to exactly what you need to do this type of work. So how'd you right. come up with that idea to build your own English wheel? I just, I'm more or less out of necessity because um, I, I never actually owned a, a formal English wheel with cast equipment from, from the British Isles, you know, they were very expensive. So we used to fabricate our own 30 years ago. And uh, so I made a few uh, myself and um, using the plans that I, I quite acquired and then uh, Ron Colvail had a, a bunch of the mechanical stuff that we welded into the framework. Um, but then, then I built two or three more of those because I was doing seminars about 15 years ago for metal crafting hands-on seminars. And um, so we used those in the class. But I always felt uncomfortable with the, the design of them. I wasn't happy with certain elements, the size, the, the, the throat, the depth, and all that. So I decided that I'm going to make myself one. <clears throat> I had a table that we were using in the shop for a long time. I had fabricated something for an uh, for a elevator, uh, an open elevator with glass uh, and stainless steel with this this um, panel that, that it was circular and it was three quarters of an inch plate steel. And we'd been using it to eat lunch on. So I, I told my friends, you know, we need to, I need to do something with this piece of metal. So I, I designed a wheel that fit my my qualifications you know shorter d depth into the throat um, the, the older ones were like 48 inches and I reduced it down to like 32 inches and then m made the draw deeper so I just designed it to fit um, just from my experience and drew up the plans and then made made patterns and laid them out on this circular 48 inch diameter three-quarter inch plate steel and cut it out with a with a cutting torch. Wow! <laughs> then then we welded it together and spent uh, we we went through five or six uh, grinding machines to get the radiuses and everything. So it ends up being three quarter inch plate steel on, on each side. So it's got an inch and a half of solid material and then cross bracing all the way down through it. Wow! But the, the it's it's a it's a it's tripodic. Uh, it was going to be um, um, uh, you know four four legged. But I decided to make, one morning and woke up and said, why don't I just come around like this? And so it's it's the only tripodic English wheel in the world hmm. that's custom built. And Do you have yeah. a patent on this? It's my legacy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Would you say that's the uh, number one used tool in your shop? Oh, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. And what, what is the weight of that, Bruce? It's about 1,100 pounds. Whoa. <laughs> Incredible. So it stays in one spot, right? Yeah, that actually rolls around. Yeah, oh, you lift the front. The, the back's got wheels on it. Okay. 
So I, I can wheel it around myself. Now, if somebody wants to see this, we, have we got this posted on our YouTube channel right Yeah, now? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah right. The video that we shot at, uh, with, at, yeah. with Bruce and with uh, Dana um, at the shop was is on our YouTube yeah, channel. Yeah, so anybody listening to this on our podcast, if yeah. you want to see any of this. Yeah, you definitely got to yeah, see it. It's platypus worth, and... It's worth watching the video because yeah, it uh, it's, it's pretty extraordinary. We spent, what, maybe an hour and a half at your shop a few weeks ago? Yeah, a I mean... A month ago? Looking at obviously looking mm -hmm. at platypus and then looking at the tool that built platypus is like you rarely get to see stuff like that and it brings me to a, a interesting point um, about the English wheel and just this type of project alone. Looking into the future, you know, do you see this becoming a dying art form or process, or do you think this will continue? I mean, what's what are your thoughts on the future of this type of uh, work on the on these type of projects from either one of you? Well, I think Bruce can uh, address that better than I can. But what I find in in restoration of cars is all these trades are going away. Uh, body shops, uh, you know, if if I were to take an old car and say, okay, I want to repaint this, I want you know you to strip it, sandblast it, or whatever, um, almost all body shops will say. Nope, won't do that. They want production work. They want stuff in and out. So they know that an old car is going to take them months to complete, sometimes years. Uh, so they don't want that kind of work. Mm. To them, that's more of a hassle than it's worth. Mm -hmm. Insurance claims. Crank them in, crank that's them it. out. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. it. That's all they want. So, I mean, that, that goes to rebuilding of gauges plating is a huge problem mm. so a lot of platers all of them have left california pretty much and and, and, uh, and mo for most people who may be listening may not understand you're talking about chrome most, you're talking about the metal chrome, chrome if yes. you want to have something refinished yes hard to find anybody who does it anyway yeah, so a lot of a lot of shops send it out to mexico too mm. yeah oh wow yeah it kind of reiterates the importance of mentoring. This is something we spoke about yes. you know, a couple of weeks ago with Kevin Haberly yep. yeah. and all the work that he and his group are doing with students and talking about auto shop. Yeah. And Dana, you've been part of that with Kevin. Mm -hmm. You've been working yeah. with him. Yeah. And yeah. you had your own auto shop when you were five years old, as you just told us. <laughs> really, I did, it, yes. It's so important to be learning from others, yeah. you know. And do you think that's uh, along the lines of, you know, the people that you run into in your business uh, Bruce, as, as far as uh, carrying on that legacy, do you feel like are there any? Is there anybody that you know of or can think of, including yourself, that are willing to, you know, pass it, pay it forward, and teach um, the next generation, or do you not see that at all? Um, I've kind of lost track of what the demand for that sort of thing is. Um, Twenty years ago, uh, when the, there was a big hot rod uh, surge. There was a lot of interest in uh, going to seminars, but it appears to be kind of resurfacing, mm. kind of a little renaissance going on. Mm. My biggest dream in, in life is to see a renaissance in the country mm. in, in, from almost every perspective you can think of, uh, which is, uh, you know, taking, taking a look backwards at what we've accomplished in, in the world and how we've done it and, and the, the craftsmanship and mm -hmm. the technology, you know, technology is just... It seems to be running rampant, but I also think there's a group of people that are looking back at what, what we've, you know, what we're missing out of our culture, and what whatever I could do to add to that, I would. Mm. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, you know, I, I did seminars for five years or so. One of my very best friends, Ron Covell, is still doing uh, seminars all over the world. So there is a a, a resurgence of interest. And uh, I'm, I'm considering uh, starting up a, a little school myself. That yeah. would be awesome. be awesome. You know who would love this conversation? Do you know who I'm thinking of? I can think of quite a few people. Richard Keller. My grandfather, yes. Who started West of Tulsa. Absolutely. And, and, and this museum. That's exactly the spirit of what he was trying to accomplish with this building. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's everything that is in this building is represent re yeah. is representative of that. Yeah. You know, that exact same thing. So when you were sitting there talking, I'm thinking, oh boy, Richard would love to be sitting in that seat right there listening to this conversation. Maybe he is. Yeah, maybe oh, he maybe is. maybe he yeah. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. He's here. Yeah, he's here. Oh. In, in us. Right there. Yeah, yeah. I think we yeah. should start some field trips. <laughs> to your spot. Yeah, yeah. Start bringing them in. I think it would be really awesome. Oh, hey, we didn't ask the obvious question. We addressed it in our video. Um, platypus. Oh, the name? The name. Oh, yeah. What was the inspiration for You know, the name? I just, I wanted something very unique that 
a car had never been branded before. I mean, you've got thousands of names for cars. And I thought, I want something very unusual and u- unique that people maybe remember, especially me as I get old. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, Platypus came out of somewhere, you know, and it's, and Mike Gossard hated that name. (laughs) What the heck are you, what is this? And I said, I don't know. I like it. And that's what it's going to be. So here we are. And you think it'll stay that way? You think it's just going to stay as platypus? You know, as Bruce knows, Bruce is is, is smiling. (laughs) as, as, As Bruce knows, um, I was looking and sometimes I look for days and hours and weeks and for different parts of the vehicle just to give it some kind of significance. So I'm online and I see a Lalique of what looks like Rocket Man. Okay. And nobody in their right mind would take a beautiful Lalique, <laughs> cut the base off of it, <laughs> and then tap it to be a, a nose piece for an unusual car. But that's exactly what we did. <laughs> but it looks great. I love it. Yeah, even Bruce likes it. Yeah, you can tell yeah. Bruce, Bruce likes That's one of the ones he accepted, right? He goes, okay, we can, oh, yeah. we can well, this. Yeah, and then everybody, I mean everybody who sees that says, are you going to light it? You included. I did it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we have... Multiple lights going on. (laughs) Well, the other thing, and I think you asked this question when we were standing next to it. Gabe, I think, asked you, are you going to put, you know, in the old style of like a World War II B-17 or something, you're going to put like a little artwork, platypus artwork on the front nose, kind of like what they did with the old bombers or anything like that? I don't think so. Just keep it, keep it the way it is. You know, Bruce said something that's very signi- significant, I think, here in less is more sometimes. Mm, yeah, there you go. And I think it is so sleek in its look, I don't think you need more stuff. Yeah, mm. yeah. No, it's beautiful the way it is. I mean, what you guys have accomplished in three and a half years is pretty amazing. And it'll be all uh, metal. There will be no paint on the car, correct? No paint. No paint. Not if I have it my way. No. No. <laughs> Don't want paint. Yeah. 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 And the other obvious question, how soon will it be ready? And will we see it on the streets? About a year. Okay. Yeah. So It's not long. Most people that I know, myself included, that have projects going on for many, many years can't stick with one project. Do you have another one going on or planning on another one? I have too many. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, I knew it. I do. I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to give you a sense, so you rebuilt a Franklin, right? And many. That was, well, the last one I saw, I don't, it, the whole thing was pretty much shot. The photos, you couldn't even tell it was a car. Now it looks like a Franklin. What, which one is that? Which year is that? That was the 25 Boat Tail. That's it. 25 Boat Tail Franklin. Then you built a recreation Bugatti? Oh, the uh, Talbo. Talbo. That's what it is. Mm-hmm. So you have, that's that's pretty cool. We I've driven in that. That thing drives beautifully. Mm-hmm. Um, you got the fire truck. You got Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. That That's a story. We could do an entire hour just on Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> Go to our website. Is that, did I do something on Chitty? You did. I did. I you wrote did. up an article on Chitty. Yeah, it's on our so, blog. Yeah, it's on our website at yeah. westtulsa.com, so you can read on that. But that's Dana's. Uh, that's his one of his dreams. So do you keep all the projects? Do you sell them? Do you wrap charity? Where do, you, do you have them all still? You know, it's, it's interesting. You buy a car that you really think you got to have, okay, and you work with it. Sometimes you rebuild it, play with it. And then sometimes you lose interest in that vehicle. Yeah. And th- that's happened many times. So, and then if I lose interest in a vehicle, I switch to another one. So it's an evolving thing. And my wife, she doesn't understand me, but that's <laughs> that's okay. I know the feeling. So <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> so she, um, you know, and... Uh, Collecting cars, old cars, I mean, you you run into multiple problems because of their age, storage, insurance. um, It's just uh, so they all take lots of attention. Mm -hmm. The probably one of my favorite cars is the 1917 Templar. Oh, yeah. Which nobody's heard of. And they 
they built very few cars, but it's a, it's a beautiful car, and it's so far ahead of its time. Mm. Uh, Templar would have been or could have been um, a significant product, but their timing was so bad because um, there was a, uh, a number of Masons, and this is in the Cleveland area, they got together, pooled their money, and they said, you know, building cars is really catching on. So why don't we build a car and let's call it a Templar. Knights Templar. Mm -hmm. And so they did. The biggest problem is World War I. Mm. Okay, so they, um, they stole the engineer from the Mercer. And the Mercer was the fastest car, let's say, in racing in the world at the time. Beating Stutz and others. And the, the, so, route, the runabout. I think it was in the Mercer runabout was one of theirs. Yeah. I think. Yep, the, that was their race car. Yep. Right. So anyway, they stole that engineer to design their engine, which was an overhead valve engine, four liters, which is a big engine for four, four cylinders. Anyway, so, but the problem with that is World War I, they were unable to source so many things, especially rubber mm -hmm. and getting tires. Um, so instead of trying to produce 4,000 uh, the first year, which is the year I have, the Roadster, they built 400. And so they were eventually bought out by General Motors and uh, then went by the wayside. Mm. Now, that, that is a very interesting car. Yeah. The history behind it, too, is pretty. Because you've got a lot of accessories that come with it. That I do. You believe are original to the car. Yes, and you did. You did a piece on the Templar also. Yeah, a little bit of research into its history. We found yes. some really interesting things about it. Previous owners and yes, we, and it ended up taking us back to Cleveland. It did. Yeah. So yeah. How many um, cars do you have? A, a, a dozen. So that would include platypus. Last time you counted. <laughs> <laughs> you do eventually sell. I do. And then, what do you look for? And somebody who you sell one of your cars to money is that all you, you, you don't <laughs> well he's got a fun product not that, not that, is that all but th there are other layers to it no i uh, it depends on the car mm -hmm. you know if i have very little attachment to it mm -hmm. it's whoever highest bid mm -hmm. you know and goodbye so but other cars i want to know that it's going to a good home because mm -hmm. that's that was my intention I put a lot of energy, money into this. And um, so s three of my cars went to uh, a museum in Cyprus, hmm. which is kind of interesting. And that was through a, a bring a trailer auction. Wow. Oh, wow. Mm. Yeah. So hmm. you just don't know. No. And with the Internet, you know, the, the world is your oyster yeah, out there. That's right. So. No. And then you are working on a really interesting car, you said, an electric vehicle and not modern day. I guess it's going to arrive today, right? Is that what you said? Yeah, it's arriving today. Um, yeah. I, I'm not real familiar with it. I've just done a little bit of research um, about the actual car, but it's uh, it's a very unusual in the 1917 uh, Rosh Lee. It's a 16. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, yeah. 19, yeah. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll have Dana <laughs> take over from is here. Is this another he, Dana car? He, he, no, oh, he's, no, it's a very dear friend of his, so, but yeah. he's oh, more familiar okay. with the car than I am. Well, uh, Jim Harris found this car on Bring a Trailer. It's, it's a Roush Lang. And it, it was amazingly original. And uh, the Roush Lang was one of the first electric cars out there. And so when he got this car, you know, it was described beautifully. But when you look at the car and you really study the car and very little lit literature came with it, um, it has the original wiring, which is just totally crazy because we're talking how many hundred plus years yeah. old? Mm -hmm. um, It'd be all brittle and cracked. Yes, and, yeah. but it's it was nice. The upholstery was beautiful. 
Um, and if you want to see it, it'll be arriving at Bruce's shop in about an hour. <laughs> and you, the driver sits in the back and your passengers sit in front of you. That's cool. And it's got a tiller, not a steering wheel, a tiller. Mm -hmm. So um, Jim, trying to get more information on the car, um, I took him over to the Nethercut Museum. The Nethercut has a 1914 Roush Lang, mm -hmm. which is the identical body style, identical. So they have it on display in their main uh, showroom. And we took dozens of pictures of that to compare with what he has. And uh, what Bruce is in the process of doing is rebuilding um, the sideboards on it. So, and I've seen... Have they just corroded away, or...? Well, the original sideboards, who, who knows oh. what happened to oh, okay. them. Maybe they corroded or whatever. But what was on there, I think, was just wood. Yeah, they just right. put Covered some, wood. Yeah, they just put some... So based on the photos from the Nethercut, you guys know what should be there. Correct. And that's what and, you're going to recreate. And a couple of other sources. Okay. Yeah. And you made it sound like it's really big. I mean, I'd love to see images of this. And almost, in my mind, I'm picturing a paddy wagon. I mean, it's this <laughs> tall, right? Yeah. You well, look. you see the top of that door right there. It's That's the height Whoa. of, seven of foot the two. car. Yeah, so you can stand up in it. Seven foot something. Yeah, maybe. wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. Is it like a truck? Very or unusual. I mean, what would you descri uh, describe it as? Is it a tall car? Oh, yes. The very yeah. tall car. And you said something about because the women would sit in the front with their tall hats. May is that one of the reasons why it's so high? <laughs> well, or I, they just wanted to walk in and be able to walk out of the car? The, the seats are sitting at an angle like this, facing backwards. Yeah. So I'm just oh, wow. envisioning the ladies of the 20s sitting there with their, their Big, fle featherly yeah, hats that's on. That's crazy. And the driver is like, uh, he's got to look to the left and the right around the ladies. Around all their hats. <laughs> I'm just picturing a ton of wiring if this thing is so big also. Well, it, it apparently, and I'll find out real soon how much, but yeah. there's, uh, you know, several thousand pounds of, of batteries in this thing. It started out with, uh, with I, I think he said f four volt batteries, and now they've, they've switched over to 12. Sure. They've altered it back to. No, they're all six volt. Or the six volt. Oh, yeah. Wow. But okay. w one thing that maybe your audience wouldn't know, and maybe you know or don't know, but uh, electric cars were only popular for one reason. Because back then they had a range of maybe 20 miles, okay? So all the other cars in the teens were crank start. Oh. Mm -hmm. Women didn't want to crank start a car. Oh. They refused it. So the electric cars were all, not all owned or driven by women, but mostly. Hmm. They wanted to get into the game also. And that was the only way to do it mm -hmm. well and even for some guys it was it's tough to crank those things over sometimes yeah so if you can just push a button and get the thing to start up that'd be nice was this a barn find no no this was in a collection okay. uh, oh and i think i know the collection that it was in but that would be a guess okay Another interesting factor is that the electric cars are a lot more expensive than the original the cars that were being made at the time. <clears throat> With something like 1800 uh, <clears throat> that were like a Model A or whatever was uh, around 750, 800. And these were 1800, so oh, wow. more than double the price. Mm -hmm. So Tesla this was a, lu a luxury vehicle back in the day? It would be considered, yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. if you could wear your talk had in it it better be <laughs> with, the, with the flowers and the so, so the, with the max the speed is something feathers. like uh 16 miles an hour uh, well, he can get his to 20. Hmm. yeah but he's downhill he's yeah, he, <laughs> yeah so downhill <laughs> uphill is at 14. Hey, dana and bruce isn't it isn't it true that back then there was a whole thing with coach builders collaborating with cars like we always hear about you know a duesenberg and a Bu old bugattis and stuff it was like that was like a tradition back then, right? The car manufacturers weren't necessarily doing these opulent interiors on the cars and, and the, the coach itself, correct? Well, there were dozens of coach builders. And so if you were very affluent back then and you wanted to be distinguished somehow, mm -hmm. uh, you would buy a drivetrain, let's say from Pierce Arrow or Packard or one of the majors, um, mm -hmm. And you would buy their drivetrain, and then you would go to a coach builder, let's say Durham or 
or uh, J Judkins or one of those and say, okay, I want to build a car specifically for me and it has to have these characteristics and they'd have all kinds of panels with colors and so forth. So, um, and different body styles, and then you could adapt those to what your tastes were, would be. So car, cars were often bespoke back then, just like getting a suit tailored, correct? Oh yeah. Well, I have a judge Judkins built Pierce arrow, which is a 1928 and it was initially owned by uh, Louis B. Mayer. Mm. From, MGM. Uh, yeah. MGM. Yeah. And uh, so this was used as, as a lot car by MGM, you know, in the late 20s. But it was, he designed the car to look like it, it looks by Judkins, which was a coach, coach builder. Think of the butts that have been on those seats, right? Yeah. We, <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you Amazing. said it was um, mayors used to. There was somebody who was a fan. Was it Clark Gable or somebody who Clark loved Gable. it? Was it Clark yeah. Gable who loved he being loved that the, car? Loved that yeah. car. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and it's a beautiful car. I love that car too. Yeah. Is that really important to you? Also, the history of the car, who owned the car, where it was driven, how well, it was used. You know, it's interesting. It gives it some provenance. Mm -hmm. But when you're when you're selling a car. Uh, it's interesting. Some sometimes, you know, that's going to be a very important factor in pricing. Oftentimes, it's not. Hmm. And I don't know if it's the new generation coming. Or, Louis B. Mayer, who is that? Hmm. You know, who cares? You yeah. know. Um, <clears throat> so it's it should be interesting, but oftentimes it's not. Mm -hmm. And I well, think for the newer generation, how do you authenticate? Right. Yeah. That's a that's a good segue uh, yeah, about is. history of cars yeah. into uh, what. Uh, what Dana is trying to do um, with uh, other guys that he knows and like Tony Baker and right. so on and so forth about the history of, of cars and racing, especially in Santa Barbara. Um, how long have you been in Santa Barbara? Cause you came, you said you came from Chicago, right? Well, I arrived, uh, my, my folks bought a pharmacy in La Cumbra Plaza in 1970. I was in Riverside at the time and I had just gotten out of uh, the military. So I was, driving back and forth and I thought hey this place is pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> maybe I should uh, move up here so I did in 73 mm. and uh, compared to never Riverside looked back. right <laughs> never look back yeah yeah I don't need to look back at Riverside no offense to Riverside <laughs> yeah, people no. but, yeah. <laughs> um, so and, and then because uh, Santa Barbara you know as you guys know but our audience probably doesn't know has a huge uh, history of racing and automotive, um, just you know, in general. Um, so I, I don't know. You want to talk, elaborate that well, a little bit? Maybe as the segue, mm -hmm. um, I'm working on a project looking at local racing up and down the coast, and uh, my inspiration for that was, in a way, Tony Baker after reading his West Coast Racing uh, books. And so kind of following his format, which would actually start in Lompoc, just post-World War II, where the Model T Club came into being, and they were very active in the Lompoc area. But then drifting down south, you know, this caught on. A lot of uh, World War II guys, GIs, um, were looking for something exciting to do. And modifying cars was a big deal. So uh, a lot of other things came to be. One of those was the airport races in Santa Barbara. That was a huge deal. And if you read the billboards on that, some of the most prominent racers in the world came to Santa Barbara to race at those uh, racing events. Mm. So, I mean, and then... There's Bonneville Racing, you know, and Seth is part of that. and uh, Who we hope to have on at some point. Right. It'd be and then, great to have you know, the, his book starts out with um, Sam Foose and his uh, customizations. And so we know Chip Foose, obviously, and I'd love to have him on that program. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes on to drag racing and other kinds of racing. Um, SCCA racing, 
So, and we've got a huge pool of experts, including uh, Lee Hammock, who actually raced at the Thum Thunder Bowl, which has been gone for 70 or 80 years now. <laughs> but that right? was in Carpinteria. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, he's still alive, very, very active, and, and uh, he'd be a great one to have on that on a panel and we've yeah. talked about wanting to just document these stories yeah because they're here and yeah they're the well, ones to tell them yeah and you know my vision was to have a panel of all these guys together and just go one by one maybe you as the moderator oh i would do it in a heartbeat yeah and then <laughs> just go one by one and i think it would be extremely exciting but it would especially in a historical vein mm -hmm. yeah yeah to get it recorded because nobody lasts forever. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think there's people, myself included, until up until a few years ago, realizing how popular Santa Barbara was, Ventura, you know, in the racing community, and how many big names came out of these areas or came to the area to race or to work on their cars, and how many ma manufacturers. I mean, people didn't know that Magnuson yeah. was here for, well, still here, uh, you know, and, um, Jerry, you know, how he's a big state. I ran into him at restaurants here for lunch and stuff like that. So just it's kind of cool that a lot of people don't know that how much history is in just yeah. in our Santa Barbara, Ventura County. We'd uh, like to area. change that and let people know about it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, with that, you know, anything we could do to be a part of that panel and help you out, because I think that would be a, a huge deal um, just to capture that and to share that, those stories. Well, luckily, one of my friends became Andy Granatelli. Oh. And... Uh, how I met uh, Tony Baker is a spinoff from Andy Granatelli, which doesn't make a lot of sense in a way. But when he died, I worked with his son, Vince. And Vince had a, uh, a hangar over in, um, in the Phoenix area. And it had, I mean, the hangar was just full of trophies and memorabilia and cars and uh, you know it it was just amazing how much stuff and then vince had his jet in there and it was piled all around with andy's stuff and he says i gotta get rid of some of this stuff <laughs> and i said you know what the murphy auto museum may be very interested and he said, you know what? You can have it all. Wow. But you have to pay for the transportation yeah. over. Okay, I'll do it. So we still have a lot of Andy Granatelli. And how uh, Tony Baker comes into this, I didn't have time. I was owning and running my Alzheimer's uh, facility. And so I contacted Tony Baker and I said, Tony, can you and I work on this to catalog all this stuff and inventory it? And he was just gung-ho wow. because part of this inventory were thousands of um, videotapes of different events, including Indy 500s and other races. Um, and we still have those. Wow. And talk about history. That's awesome. Yeah. Big time. That's so cool. So often families dump this stuff away, excuse me, and you, it's gone. It's so gone that's forever. It's wonderful yeah. to, to have kept yeah. it all. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's our whole mission here is to capture right. every story that we can humanly capture right now. And you can go over and see it right now at the Murphy. You know, they got a whole room and a hallway dedicated to Andy Granatelli, and there's still a lot more than what they've displayed. So yeah, it's pretty fun. Right. A lot of STP stuff. A lot of STP, yes. <laughs> STP. Well, I remember oh. STP stickers. My oh, yeah. had them all oh, over yeah. the place growing <laughs> up. Them, yeah. And Andy Granatelli's full out suit, just uh -huh. like everything's STP stamped everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I remember that as a kid. Yeah. And seeing mm -hmm. the photos of it over the Murphy is pretty yeah, fun. It is. Boy, it's been so much fun having you two on. Dana Newquist, Bruce Terry, thank you again for coming and down and joining us and talking about platypus. So we're looking forward a year from now. Uh, we, we're going to have you stop by West of Tulsa and 
We'll do a check-in in six, well, six months. See what a, year, <laughs> a year from now, I hope to be pulling that into your parking lot. Yeah. yeah. We hope Wait for. to see it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll hear the rumble. With that 48 flathead coming in. It'll have glass packs. <laughs> yeah. You'll be driving. Bruce is going to be on the roof waving flags and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. How do, you, how do you plan to back that thing up since you can't see in the back? I've got a camera. Oh, you're going to put a camera. Oh, so you're going to have some t some tech on there. Some I, I have hidden to. tech, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. You gotcha. know, but yeah, I mean, you know, puts, putting some trunk or truck mirrors on the side, that's not going to Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... It is a great name, platypus, a mammal that lays eggs, right? How unique. Comes out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. it does. I love it. All right. Like well, it. thank you, guys. All right. Thank you for watching. Don't forget, we've got our, if you go to our website, you can go to our tip line page. We'd love to have you in studio. I should have done this at the top because nobody ever sees this. Part. Yeah, man. I never make yeah, it to the all right. That's all right. When did you, you say get... last time we had only one person who's made it to end one of our shows? Yeah, and I, God, think, it was, I think it was me. So Okay. <laughs> so we have their tip line page. Go there. Put your name in it. Fill it out. Send it in to us. We'd love to have you here in studio. Also, like, follow, subscribe. And we have our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. And we thank you. And we'll see you west of Tulsa.